Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Diane Kleinfelder. I'm the curator for the Captain Thomas Espy Grand Army of the Republic post, um, located within the historic Andrew Carnegie Free Library and Music Hall in Carnegie. Um, and I'm, before introducing our speaker, um, I just wanted to give you a couple announcements. Uh, we still have a speaker lined up for September the 12th. Uh, we, we generally uh, take July and August off um, and we're gonna continue to do that and then hopefully meet up again live in September, uh, but we'll keep you posted. And that speaker is um, Steve Fan, who is a National Park Ranger and he's gonna talk on the Civil War defenses of Washington, which I understand is, is quite a good talk. Um, from the library, uh, news about the library is that we are starting curbside pickup. Um, you can, if, if the Andrew Carnegie Library isn't your home library, you can still call us to place a hold for any of our Civil War materials that you haven't had access to for the last three months. But you will have to come over to Carnegie to pick it up. Um, and if you just want to give me a call, um, I'd be glad to help you with that. Um, and then I believe it's, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Walker, our library director is joining in. Hello. But it should be after 4th of July that open to the public. Yes, we, we plan to open our doors to the public on Monday, July 6th. That's correct. Okay. All righty. So you can place your holds and you'll be able to come and uh, actually browse the collection. And I'm, we've started ordering again. So I just placed an order this morning for some of the newest Civil War uh, books that have come out. So um, let me get going here with our speaker, who is uh, Chris White. Um, Chris is a, a really good friend of the library and the music hall. He, um, this is probably about the eighth time that he has uh, spoken for us and he jumped in here at the last minute when we had to cancel our Civil War Pittsburgh bus tour that we were going to do today. And it would have been a beautiful day for, for a, a tour of Pittsburgh. Um, we've just put that on the back burner and <clears throat> hopefully um, maybe next spring uh, we'll be able to do that one again. But I gave Chris a call and he said, sure, he'd be glad to help us out. Uh, Chris is the senior education manager at the American Battlefield Trust. And he holds a bachelor's in military history from Norwich University, a uh, master's and a bachelor's uh, in history from California University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he served as a staff military historian at the Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. He is the co-founder of Emerging Civil War and co-creator of Engaging the Civil War series, which is a partnership between the Southern Illinois University Press and Emerging Civil War. He is an award-winning speaker and editor and has authored, co-authored, or edited nearly two dozen books. And he frequently leads tours in the United States and abroad. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Chris White talking about Ike and Gettysburg. Thanks, Diane. I'm, I'm just imagining rapturous applause for that biography coming from everybody who's online right now, since we're not all together. Um, giving a talk on Zoom is something that's really an acquired taste, and, and it's been a great platform for all of us during all this COVID. Um, but I tell you what, it really throws you off the first few times you do it. Um, but uh, as Diane and I were talking before we started, we were probably getting Zoomed out because we've done so many of these now. Um, and they've been very worthwhile, but I'm looking forward to hitting the battlefields, as I'm sure many of you are as well. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the COVID has given us a, a different way to, to reach out to each other. So luckily, I didn't have to drive all the way up to Pittsburgh uh, from D.C. to do this talk with you all. But, um, you know, today, what what I figured we talk about is, uh, you know, looking at the 76th anniversary of D-Day just happening about a week ago. Um, talk about Dwight Eisenhower, Ike, uh, as he'll be referred to throughout this talk, and um, his ties to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Um, you know, here, here is a tie between uh, one of the legendary figures in American military history and politics from the 20th century, 
um, and he has his ties to, you know, the Allied liberation of Europe uh, and the D-Day uh, landings on June 6th of 1944. Uh, and he has a huge tie to, to Gettysburg, which most people don't even realize. Um, and it, it's a fascinating tie. He, he's a student of military history throughout all of his life, uh, but he specifically loves Gettysburg and he'll go there many times throughout his life and he will actually live there. Um, owning his own home, he and Mamie, and we'll talk about that and show you that today. Um, so as we uh, get started, you know, one thing that, that uh, they wanted me to pass along to you is if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, to type those into either uh, the chat feature on Zoom or feel free to do that on Facebook and we'll try to answer those at the end um, with the presentation of, I can't see any of those um, that are on that are on Zoom, but I can see it on Facebook because I'm following along. So if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm following along on my phone. Uh, to what you guys are, are saying. And what we're going to do here is start off, talk about Ike uh, from the soldier gentleman, from a soldier to gentleman farmer. So, you know, Dwight Eisenhower, this is a picture taken of him and his uh, D-Day command staff, essentially. Um, Ike is sitting in the middle staring at us uh, alongside um, you know, Sir Trafford Lee Mallory and um, Montgomery, you'll have Walter Beetle Smith off to the one side and you'll have Omar Nelson Bradley off to the other side. And uh, this is really going to be the command staff that probably Eisenhower is best known for, which will be the, the June 6, 1944 landings in Normandy. But Eisenhower prior to this um, is going to have a long uh, and storied career throughout the United States military. The D-Day landings were not his first, um, nor will they be his last campaign because it's going to take a long time to get over to Germany and finally force their capitulation about one year after the Allied landings. Um, so, you know, this is what a lot of people think of Eisenhower when they when they see him. They see him as this uh, commander. Um, you know, one of the most famous pictures is him on the D minus uh, one. Uh, June 5th, 1944, there on the right-hand side, him talking to members of the 101st Airborne Division um, who are getting ready to uh, board their planes and fly over Normandy uh, and to be dropped in and, in and around Normandy, you know, made famous by that great miniseries Band of Brothers. Other people, uh, you know, know Eisenhower as he is portrayed on the left-hand side of our screen, and that is him as the 34th President of the United States. Uh, very successful statesman, very successful uh, general. Uh, and Eisenhower, you know, uh, this is what most people know about him. But, but Eisenhower has a, has a lot of different sides to him. Uh, he, he's a very interesting guy. He, he's very jovial, uh, huge smile on his face. One, uh, one uh, U.S. serviceman said that his smile was worth 20 divisions alone uh, because he's so effusive, um, very genuine, very warm. People really, really tend to uh, move towards Ike or gravitate towards him. He does have a fiery temper on him, but he really believes in teamwork. And uh, after the after the Second World War, he'll take up painting. You can see him uh, sitting here painting on the left hand side. Um, this one, I believe, is at Camp David. On the right hand side, you'll actually see him painting um, three of his grandchildren. Uh, this painting actually hangs in the Eisenhower National Historic Site today. So he loves to paint, um, and he has all kinds of different paintings. Um, and then. You know, most people don't understand Ike and his love of football. Uh, Ike's actually a football player uh, at West Point. He'll uh, tear up his knee pretty badly in a game against Tufts. Uh, but after the after his graduation from West Point in 1915, he becomes a football coach throughout uh, a lot of his early military career. You can actually see Ike um, sitting right here in the middle. This is him. Uh, in charge in 1916 of the St. Louis University football team. Uh, he has taken this, this job to uh, turn around a failing St. Louis club, which was uh, winless in his last three seasons. But whenever Ike takes over, he's 5-1-1 one, and one in his only season as a head coach there, uh, winning uh, five games, tying one, and, and losing one. Um, so Eisenhower loves football. He loves football because he loves the idea of the teamwork that it builds. Um, so he, he's a big sports aficionado uh, throughout his life. He loves to hunt. He loves to fish. Um, and that's one of the things that will draw him eventually to Gettysburg is, is the open air there at Gettysburg, um, as well as the idea of becoming an, a gentleman farmer. 
you know, he's also a, a, a golfer, loves the golf. He only has one hole in a hole in one in his entire life. And it's, uh, I think, in 1968. Uh, but uh, he is going to really bring the game of golf during the 1950s and 60s to the common person because everyone sees Ike uh, out here golfing. Uh, he loves to golf so much. Uh, he goes to Augusta, Augusta National a lot. And that's where he has the uh, Eisenhower Pine. The reason why it's called the Eisenhower Pine is because Eisenhower hit it so many times with his ball, um, and he he could he hated it so much he actually asked them to take it down, which they refused to do. Um, so Eisenhower, you know, he loves to golf. There'll be a putting green that you'll see at Gettysburg. I'll show you that in a little while and tell you a little story about him and his one granddaughter Susan. Uh, but he loves his grandkids. And this is a picture on the left of him and Mamie uh, with two of their grandkids, uh, David and I think Susan there. On the right-hand side, you can see the, the president putting on uh, a kepi on David, which is his eldest, uh, eldest grandson. And uh, it looks like a Confederate kepi, and David looks none too happy to have to wear this thing. Uh, but this is one of the many golf carts that Eisenhower will have for, for his farm that he uses at Gettysburg. Um, so, you know, there are many sides to, to Eisenhower, and, and he loves his family, loves his grandchildren specifically. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see John Eisenhower. That is uh, Ike and Mamie's second son. Uh, John will eventually, he'll, he'll graduate from the United States Military Academy at West Point and he will go on to become a brigadier general himself. Uh, but to be a grandkid of uh, President Eisenhower was paid pretty big dividends in the 50s because here's Roy Rogers coming to your party uh, and you could see the candles being blown out because Eisenhower loves Westerns. Uh, he reads Western novels, watches Westerns on television, loves Western movies. Uh, so he gets Roy Rogers to become his, his, son, his uh, grandson's uh, a visitor here during his birthday but i love the picture over here of this horrifying clown who would let this clown come into someone's someone's uh, birthday party that is going to give the child nightmares for years i mean i don't know who came up with that one uh but i love showing that picture um of him uh but but what dwight david eisenhower to give you a, a background a very quick background on who he actually is he's actually going to be born in, in texas and his family will move to a abilene kansas now, he, he's going to grow up uh, in later years, say he doesn't realize that he's poor, but they grow up, um, you know, fairly poor. Um, and it doesn't have as much to do with the family standing as much as it has to do with his father and his father's um, uh, not being very good at business, nor is he very good at managing money. Uh, at one point, his father's actually going to run away from the family uh, and then come back to them. Um, he's very standoffish, almost aloof man, uh, where his, his mother, Ida, is going to be very loving throughout most of his, his childhood. But Dwight is going to be born in October of 1890. Uh, he is going to uh, be the third of the six children who uh, are the Eisenhower boys, all boys Ida had. So she was definitely outnumbered in her home. To give you an idea um, of what the family looked like. Here's the, the family in 1902 on the left hand side. Uh, and then on the right hand side, I hope you can pick out Eisenhower yourself. Uh, but he is or Ike himself. That's him right there. Um, him standing behind his, his father and his mother. Ida looks almost exactly the same in these two pictures that are about 40 years apart. Um, or 30 years apart, which is pretty entertaining here. But that's them at their home in Ambl Abilene, Kansas, um, which is today a uh, part of the Eisenhower Presidential Library and Historic Site. Uh, but he's going to grow up. Um, he, he's, a, he's a fair student. He's not a great student. He knows it. He, he's going to blame it on the fact that he's um, that he has a probably a pretty poor teacher in school. Uh, but eventually he's going to decide that he wants to go off to college. Uh, the Eisenhowers, uh, their sons themselves are going to be very successful, the Eisenhower sons. Uh, Ida and um, Dwight's father are both going to be, you know, very interested in seeing the boys get a higher education. Uh, and Ike doesn't go immediately off to West Point. This is a picture of him in June of 1911 on the left. And on the right, this is a picture he's actually going to give Mamie um, of him graduating from West Point. And it says, for the decent and sweetest girl in the, in the world, or I'm sorry, the dearest and sweetest girl in the whole world. And that's love, Ike. Um, he's going to decide to stay back in Abilene and work in a dairy factory where his father's working to help put his brother through Michigan. 
after about two years, he doesn't like this idea and he decides that he wants to go off to a, a school of his own, um, thinking he wants to go to Michigan himself because he wants to play football or baseball or some other sport. Uh, but he, he talks to a, a friend named Sweet Hazlitt. He's friends with him throughout his entire life. And Hazlitt wants to go to, um, wants to, go to the United States Naval Academy. Well, it turns out that Hazlitt wasn't as good as he, he should be at, at mathematics and can't get in. And Eisenhower can't get in because he's one year too old for the, for the acceptance ages. So what Ike is going to end up doing is, is applying uh, and receiving uh, an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, he is going to uh, go there and he's going to you know, play football while he's there, uh, as I showed in that picture earlier. And he is going to do pretty well. Uh, at the academy. Um, he's not the best student. He's not the worst student. Demerits definitely are going to hurt him. He has over 120 odd demerits while he's there. Uh, but Eisenhower really likes the idea of the camaraderie of the Corps. He likes the tradition of the Army. Um, and he, he really wants to excel in this career, even though at first he doesn't know if he's going to stick with the Army. Um, this is a picture of, of the Army football team uh, with uh, Dwight Eisenhower over here. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see Omar Nelson Bradley, uh, who will eventually serve under Eisenhower in Europe. Uh, so two five-star generals are actually shown in this Army uh, uh, picture here, in this uh, Army football picture. So Eisenhower, uh, after he graduates, he's going to go down to Fort Sam Houston. Uh, that'll be his first real posting, which is really a posting that everybody wants to go to. Um, and Fred Funston will be in charge of it. He's a, he's a legend in the Army. And Funston um, will take a liking to Eisenhower, so much so that he's actually going to offer Eisenhower uh, a, a um, spot at a private school where he can be the football coach. Ike turns down that, that uh, offer from Funston. And then he's brought back in front of Funston where Funston basically says, you're going to take this uh, because he's in the army now. And for $150, here goes Eisenhower off to help coach football. But while he's at Sam Houston, he's going to meet uh, Mary, uh, Mary Geneva Dowd, who is better known as Mamie. Uh, this is a picture of their, uh, their wedding picture here on the left-hand side. And the, the two of them will, will meet in 1915. And by 1916, July 1st, he's going to be married to Mamie. Uh, to show you how, how <laughs> devoted he was to Mamie, just to show you how uh, stubborn he could be, uh, he is going to ask Mamie out. And Mamie is going to say that, well, I have dates for the next five weekends. So what does he do? He goes over to the Dowd house, meets with his meets with uh, Mamie's parents every Saturday night so that when she comes back from her dates, he's sitting on the front porch there waiting for her, uh, kind of showing that he's still interested. Uh, and on Valentine's Day of 1916, he'll he'll propose to her and they'll get married on July 1st, 1916. On the right hand side, you'll see a picture. Um, this is them with their son. Uh, his name is David Dowd or Dowd David. Um, Eisenhower. He's known as Ikey or Icky. Those are his two nicknames. Um, this is their first son that they'll have. And um, this small family is going to start basically moving around the country, um, as it were. They'll have a second son. His name is John Eisenhower. There's John on the left-hand side with Mamie. That's at his West Point graduation. Uh, he is actually going to graduate the uh on june 6th 1944 so dad was a little busy that day but mom was able to be there at his west point graduation on the right hand side is a picture of a five-star general eisenhower on the left and a young john as a first or as a second lieutenant on the right um when he first goes over to europe john he's going to go over to his father's headquarters and the two of them will make their way to london to kind of have a, a celebratory dinner that the son is over here uh in europe and um, as they're walking down the street, John becomes very worried that uh, they're going to pass an officer who's going to salute him. Uh, you know, who's supposed to salute who? And, and Ike becomes a little miffed and he says, there's no one around here that outranks me. And there's no one around here that you outrank. So you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but the two of them uh, will, will uh, serve over in the European theater. John um, will live until 1913, or I'm sorry, 2013 when he passed away. And uh, he'll serve on his father's presidential staff and he'll help organize his, his memoirs. And John will actually live in Gettysburg 
So, so why are we going to talk about Ike in Gettysburg today? Um, this is a picture of Little Round Top. Um, you'll see a couple of monuments here. The 146 New Yorks is in front, the 155th Pennsylvania is over there to the right. And standing on the rocks on the left are um, Eisenhower and uh, Sir, the, the victor of Al Alamein, uh, Bernard Law Montgomery. Montgomery came here in 1957 uh, as part of a visit to Ike uh, and to visit him and Mamie at their home in Gettysburg. And this is going to come back to haunt both of them here. We'll talk about that here in, in just a few minutes. Um, but this is Ike shown here at Gettysburg. And he, he's going to always love military history. Uh, Ike is going to talk about having a few different people that he really respects. The first person that he, he really falls in love with in history is Hannibal, um, the man who helps lead Carthage against Rome. But he really has a love for uh, four different Americans. Uh, he, he's really going to have a great respect for Benjamin Franklin, Robert E. Lee. Uh, he'll have a respect for Abraham Lincoln and above all, George Washington. And when he's in, in uh, office as president, he'll have four portraits in the Oval, Oval Office. And it's the portraits of those four men that I just named. Uh, so Eisenhower loves military history. He loves history and books so much that he wouldn't do his chores as a kid. And his mom would actually take the books, hide it in a closet that she could lock. When she would leave, he would go steal the key, unlock the books, and start to read again. So Eisenhower loves to read about military history, um, especially as a young man. So he comes to Gettysburg actually for the first time in May of 1915. And this is one of my favorite pictures of any era from Gettysburg. This is actually a picture taken uh, on May 3rd, 1915, on the steps of uh, the Lutheran Church, which is along Chambersburg Street. It's right across the street from the Gettysburg uh, the, uh, the James Geddes Hotel. And this is um, a picture of the class of 1915. Uh, as a senior class tradition, West Point would bring you down to Gettysburg. The idea was to learn from the uh, battle here to show how leadership could uh, come forth from these men, talk about the tactics of the time, talk about the strategy, and really um, to get the, the men thinking because they're getting ready to go off to the army and off to their different postings. Um, and this is usually the last hurrah for the, for the cadets before they graduate. Uh, so as you're, as you're sitting here looking at this, first off, you have the monument to the 90th Pennsylvania uh, Infantry and their uh, chaplain, that's Horatio Howell, who was uh, allegedly shot down by Confederates on these steps uh, in cold blood. Uh, there are a few different stories about that. And then you have a picture of Eisenhower sitting here, a cocky young, just about to become a lieutenant. And then you have over here, Omar Nelson Bradley, just kind of sitting back chilling. Um, and these guys are young, they're cocky, and they're ready for their careers to start. You also know you're close to graduation whenever you start seeing guys like down here in the front row smoking cigarettes. Uh, because these are forbidden on campus. Uh, Ike is going to smoke throughout much of his life. Uh, and at West Point, he is going to roll Bull Durham tobacco, uh, which is completely against regulations and sometimes is what's going to lead to some demerits. Um, so Ike is, is going to be a smoker, which will, will come back to, to harm his health later on in life. Uh, but this is a fantastic photograph. And it's the first time that Ike comes to Gettysburg and he starts to fall in love with the idea of the battle uh, and the battlefield itself. And um, he will return, as we know, many times. Now, now to give you a little bit of background on Ike's, one of his early postings, which will be here in Gettysburg at a place called Camp Colt in 1918, we, we have to talk a minute about the, the park itself. And the military has, has used Gettysburg through, through many years. Uh, you have the July 1863 battle, but then you start to look uh, forward into 1895 when the park becomes a national military park. And that means it's going to fall under the auspices of the War Department, today the Department of Defense. So these battlefields, in their initial legislation to have them brought into the, the federal government under, the, under its protection, what is going to happen is that um, there is going to be some clauses placed in here. Yes, we're going to protect this cultural and, that, and historical uh, landmark, but in cases of national emergency, we're allowed to use it uh, as training facilities and for other, other um, 
operations. And the War Department throughout the First World War and into the 1920s and into the 1940s will use a lot of our military parks, not just Gettysburg, to uh, house soldiers, to house German POWs, to train soldiers, and for propaganda purposes. Now, this picture that you're seeing here uh, is a picture of a 1922 Marine Corps exercise. And I use that term very loosely. It's not so much an exercise, it's actually a big propaganda move as the War Department's trying to figure out their budgets after the First World War. They're trying to shrink the Army down. And you have this new pesky Air Corps uh, that you're starting to deal with. And you're going to have to potentially pay for that. So what you're looking at is a massive Marine contingent. Uh, here is in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide, that's the Virginia Memorial. So this encampment that you're seeing here is actually going to be on the fields of Pickett's Charge. This is right over top of where Pickett's Virginians will march out. Uh, they uh, have out here uh, their officers' quarters and some other things. You can see plenty of cars driving around out here. They have landed planes. Those aren't just planes. The larger ones off to the left are bombers because um, they're going to do full-scale full maneuvers out here on the battlefield. And this picture is actually taken uh, from a from a balloon. These are two balloons that were up here at Gettysburg taking photographs, aerial photographs. Again, this is basically for propaganda purposes. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that that I find entertaining about it is that somehow they accidentally shot down one of these balloons. Don't worry, the pilot's OK, because you can see him bailing out. Um, over top of this one farmland here, uh, but you can see the smoky remnants falling onto the battlefield itself. Uh, this is over the fields of Pickett's Charge. You can see the Kadori barn right out here. So um, these are out in the, in the fields where Pickett's men would go forward. So we talk about preservation of these battlefields. You know, yes, the, these battlefields, they are going to be preserved, but they are going to be over time damaged um, by military use and other uses as well. Um, but the, the um, military will come to get us for many times. And with, with um, having camps over here, known as Camp Sharp, uh, that'll be a World War II era camp. And that will uh, be part of a uh, propaganda unit, for lack of a better term. And it will also serve as a POW camp. Uh, there'll be a POW camp right here. Uh, and some of the Germans will escape during 1944 on July 3rd of 1944, which was the, I think, 81st anniversary of Pickett's Charge. So there's some irony there. Um, then you will have a massive camp, which will uh, go down through this area, which I'll show you a picture of in a second. Uh, two camps specifically that I'll show you pictures of. So the military will be all over this battlefield. These are just some of the installations that they'll put in here. And um, when America enters World War I, they are going to place a large camp here on the fields of Pickett's Charge. This is actually called the Camp of United States Troops, Gettysburg. This picture is taken in 1917, and it's the forerunner of a camp that uh, General Eisenhower at the time, Captain Eisenhower, will take over. What you're looking at here is a picture taken from the large Pennsylvania Memorial, looking out across Hancock Avenue. You can see the Vermont, Vermont Monument here. Um, and you can see a massive city of over 400 buildings and tents that has been placed here to train United States infantry during the, during the uh, summer and fall of 1917. The 58th, 59th, 60th, and 61st United States infantry alongside the 4th and, US, 4th and 7th U.S. infantry will train here at Gettysburg. So you can see how much this has changed. So much so that here's the, the camp map to give you an idea. And when Eisenhower comes here one year later, his headquarters will be right here off to the right hand side. That is actually today behind um, General Pickett's Buffet, uh, which is along Steinware Avenue, the Emmitsburg Road. There's a KFC there uh, and General Pickett's Buffet. And then down the, down the road, you would have the camp hospital uh, over in this area. This is actually where Louis Armistead will be wounded, which most of you know about, um, during Pickett's Charge. You can see just how close the camp comes here. And in fact, they're going to make a lot of changes. They're going to do a lot of damage. One particular piece of damage that they will inflict upon the battlefield is right here. You might notice the word swimming pool. Yes, there was a swimming pool right on the Gettysburg battlefield. And it took me years to find a picture of it, but I finally found the picture of this, this swimming pool. This thing is massive. Uh, it sits on the Kadori farm. 
and it has been filled in, but if you know where to look, you can still find uh, the remnants of, of where, where the um, uh, swimming pool once sat. Uh, but this is what you're going to start to see the army do to this battlefield uh, in the 19 teens. So uh, Dwight Eisenhower throughout early 1917 is going and, and late 1917 is going to be training soldiers uh, to go off to war. Uh, he'll be training part of the 56th, I believe, U.S. infantry to go across uh, to fight in Europe. Um, he's he's going to be transfer around. Eventually, he's going to be attached to the 65th Engineers, which are the first unit to basically turn into tankers. Uh, so they'll be redesignated the 301st um, Tank Battalion, and he will be in charge of Company A of this battalion. And Eisenhower wants nothing more than to go over to Europe and to see action. Uh, remember, in World War I, it's the first time we're really going to use tanks in combat. Um, one of the big proponents of, of tanks will be Winston Churchill, somebody who, who uh, Eisenhower knows very closely throughout the rest of his life whenever he goes over to the Second World War. Um, and Eisenhower sitting here at, at a place called Camp Colt. Camp Colt is, is uh, an offshoot of that camp that I just showed you, the camp of the United States um, soldiers, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Um, this is going to be a tank training ground, the first tank training ground in United States military history. And Dwight D. Eisenhower in March of, of 1918 is going to be um, sent to Gettysburg and he is going to be put in charge of this training camp. Eisenhower throughout most of his career is known as a great administrator. He's a great staff officer um, and his reputation is known far and wide. Uh, throughout the army, and he's going to serve under some of the most influential soldiers of his time and of American history. But Eisenhower, when he sent to Gettysburg now for the second time, is just devastated. Uh, he, he said his mood was very black because he wanted to go over to Europe, but he's he sent here to train tankers to go across into, into Europe. Eventually, he'll train about 10,600 men at Camp Colt. Uh, he'll rise to the rank of lieutenant colonel, brevet lieutenant colonel, uh, and something this would never have happened to if somebody who had just graduated uh, West Point in 1915. And I should mention, his class in 1915 is known as the class that the stars fell upon, uh, meaning that there are 59 general officers to come out of that 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 class, um, including him and and Bradley that we that I pointed out, and of course a future president who is Eisenhower. So. He is going to be placed in charge of this, this camp, Camp Colt, and he's upset about it. He comes here in March of, of 1918, and eventually he, he's going to be joined by um, a few men. And the men you see in this picture uh, are actually going to be a mixture. Eisenhower's on the left, and then you're going to have uh, to his right William Clopton, uh, who's with the U.S. Army. And then you have two British advisors, the, the one that's uh, sitting here uh, kind of with this cane or swagger stick, it is um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Frank Summers, who actually uh, Eisenhower will, will have a friendship with throughout the Second World War and actually write to him talking about Camp Colt during the war, uh, the Second World War. And then you have F Major Philip Hammond, uh, also of uh, the British Army over here. And they were sent here as, as basically training specialists to tell uh, Eisenhower what to do and how to use these newfangled machines of war. Now, you know, Summers is actually uh, sitting here and um, he has a black armband you, you can see here. And that's going to be from uh, memorializing his son who was, who was killed at the Naval Battle of Jutland. Um, and he, he's actually himself, Summers is actually a veteran of uh, 3rd Ypres, uh, Cambrai, uh, the Somme. I mean, he's seen some of the worst of the worst of the Western Front. Um, so these advisors are sent over here to teach these Americans just how to, how to go off to war. So Eisenhower is not very happy about his new posting, but he is going to, to take to it like he does every other one of his postings, and he's going to try his, his best to get the job done. Um, he's going to uh, uh, do everything to build the men's esprit. Uh, he's going to have them uh, publish a, a booklet called Treat em Rough. Uh, Treat em Rough is going to be the official uh, magazine of Camp Colt, which will be the Army's tank training ground. Uh, they'll also come up with the, the phrase Treat em Rough, which will be the phrase of the tank corps. Uh, and on the fields of basically where you see the Battle of Gettysburg being, being fought, uh, General Eisenhower will set up his camp of 
uh, Camp Colt. Uh, so what you're seeing here, this is the Emmitsburg Road running down here on the right hand side. Uh, you'll have uh, barracks, wooden barracks placed here. Uh, this is the Kadori House that you're seeing right here. Uh, these train tracks were not installed on the left hand side by the military. Those were here uh, as part of the Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad. Uh, they would have brought dignitaries down during the 1913 reunion. Uh, which was a massive reunion. And it's also, there's also a trolley line on this battlefield at other points. We could do an entire talk just on how Gettysburg has changed and the interpretation has changed over the years. But you can see the Pennsylvania Memorial sitting right back here on the left-hand side of the left, left uh, picture. And you can see one of the one of the doughboys walking across the tracks and you can just see how big this camp was. Um, and the problem with Camp Colt and this was a problem that the, the U.S. military will have for a long time, and that is that we have a tank training ground here at Gettysburg, but we're lacking something. We have no tanks. So what do we do? We have to start building tanks. Notice this is a tank built basically on a sled so that you can move them around, so you can at least get an idea of what a tank might look like at the time. Um, some guys from Brooklyn will actually put these together. And then you also have one put together uh, called Battle and Lizzie. This is supposed to be a Mark V tank, but it's not actually a Mark V tank. This thing was just slapped together with aluminum and other parts that they could find so that these guys could have an idea of what tank training would look like. So Eisenhower is showing that he can innovate. He's, he's allowing his men to, to think uh, he's allowing them to kind of uh, utilize what they have around them. This is another picture taken along the Emmitsburg Road. You can actually see the uh, fence back here in front of Battle and Lizzie. Um, and he, he, his guys don't actually have a tank until June 6 of 1918. Uh, so June 6 plays, plays an important role in his life on more than one occasion. So what do we do? We have the, these faux tanks. Uh, so Eisenhower comes up with a new idea. Okay. And some of his staff said, hey, we have all these trucks sitting here. Why don't we mount 30 caliber machine guns and, and other or ordnance on the top of these things? And we should ride down to Big Round Top and we should just blast away at targets down there. He thinks it's a great idea. So he, so Eisenhower is going to allow the tank corps to set up a, a firing range at Big Round Top uh, on the eastern side of Big Round Top. And they're going to fire thousands upon thousands of rounds uh, in that area. Eisenhower himself claimed that there were probably more bullets fired in that small vicinity than during the entire Battle of Gettysburg over its three days. Uh, but these are going to be the ways that these guys innovate. It's also a way that they're here on this battlefield and they are going to, you know, uh, utilize the resource as it were. So here's, here's Eisenhower standing in front of a uh, Renault uh, BT-17 tank. This tank is the only tank that will actually arrive in Gettysburg to, um, to uh, be utilized by uh, thousands and thousands of tankers. These, these guys who are supposed to learn how to drive a tank. This is a tank for two. You can see the driver here popping his head out. There's a commander who would be up here. And this is the reverse side of the turret. The gun's actually behind Eisenhower's head here. When the gun arrives, it's actually, or when the tank arrives, there's no gun on it. He actually has to mount a gun. So you get a tank, but you get no gun. Uh, and then Eisenhower is going to bring this thing out and everybody's going to be in awe of it. Um, so this Renault can um, do a whopping four miles an hour on flat, maybe five miles an hour downhill. It's going to be built mostly, uh, it'll be a mixture of cast iron and steel. It can probably withstand most small arms, but if it's going to be hit by anything, uh, artillery wise, it's, it's going to be go up pretty quickly, especially with a cast iron turret that it has on top. Um, I've seen what the Germans can do to steal over at Verdun and other places, so I can only imagine what would happen to this thing. This tank is actually real, rear wheel drive, and the front uh, wheel here is actually um, steel around wood, and then you'll have the tracks like we normally know. The, the engine's in the rear, and you can barely make it out, but there's actually a fin that comes off the back of it, which is very important because that's almost like a wheelie bar. Uh, this wheelie bar will allow you, if you go into a trench or over top of an obstacle, to not flip the tank over. So that wheelie bar is actually very, very important. Um, and so important, uh, you can actually see it on this picture, uh, so important that I'll show you in another one how easily it could be to flip one of these tanks. But now that we have a new tank, the signal core is all about the tank. we got to take pictures of it.
And there are so many pictures of this tank. I could just do a whole thing, of, a series of, of pictures of everyone standing beside the tank, in the tank, on the tank. They love their tank when they finally get it. They're very proud of it. Um, you can even see the driver in this one. I like he pe peeking his head out. Um, so we're all going to look very important around our tank, but now we need to use our tank. So how do we do this? Here we are. We're going to go out to the fields of Pickett's Charge. How do I know this is the fields of Pickett's Charge? Back here is the Virginia Memorial. Uh, sitting in the background. So we have our tank, we have infantry support. So now it's time to start doing maneuvers on the battlefield. And how do we do maneuvers on the battlefield? Well, we're gonna go find us some obstacles to run over. So what do we do? We find this big mound and we're gonna drive our tank over top of it. You can see on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, Eisenhower is gonna bring the, the infantry and in close support uh, over top and they're gonna march over top of this big embankment. Uh, you can see on the right hand side here, uh, the tank going over its obstacle. Uh, you can also see monuments out here to the 14th Connecticut and the 12th New Jersey, because what they're actually running over is the old bank of the barn for the Bliss Farm. The Bliss Farm, owned by William Bliss during the Battle of Gettysburg, sat out in the middle of the two lines, the Confederate and Union lines. And on July 3rd, the barn will burn to the ground and the house will burn to the ground because it was such a den for sharpshooters on both sides. It's the only structure that's actually ordered to be destroyed on the bat battlefield of Gettysburg, uh, or living structure, I should say, where someone's living. So now we have this cultural resource that the army's like, hey, let's just run over it with a, four with a uh, seven ton tank. Uh, so that'll do it well. Um, so that gives you an idea. That, bar that is the bank, you can go out to it today. I took these pictures last year. Um, you can see in the background, the round tops. You can see the Pennsylvania Memorial. And you can see the memorial to the United States regulars. Um, they're also hide the tank. How do we hide the tank? We'll, we'll put it either in the cellar of the old house, which is still there today, or we'll put it over in one of the drainage ditches, uh, which is essentially a dry, dry um, moat at certain times of year, except for when I was out there um, taking these pictures. So the tank is used all over. And Eisenhower is going to be very influential in um, getting this tank out there so he's he's going to really build up this this core uh, of tankers and the the idea will be to, to train the best tankers that he can and send them over to europe where they'll actually get their vehicles um he, he's very strict uh at one point the gettysburg times is going to report that at least eight train loads of his enlisted men uh, who failed their examinations and failed the rigorous training at Camp Colt were actually put on eight different train cars in late June and shipped out of camp. Uh, so this is a tough, this is a, a tough training. Um, he's also going to take part in the Memorial Day Parade, allowing his men to march through there. He'll build a very uh, solid camp uh, of, of men with great morale. He's going to allow the YMCA to come in. Uh, he is going to uh, allow them to, to really entertain the troops. He, he's going to do everything he can to build up these men. So he's learning how to, how to build an army, uh, something that will come in handy later on in his life. Now, he and Mamie and, and Icky will actually live here in Gettysburg. Uh, this, this is a, a picture of the frat house that they lived in on the Gettysburg College campus. Um, they'll live in three different homes in Gettysburg. One, uh, we don't know where it is. The second one is this one that you're looking at. This is a, a abandoned during the, the summer by a fraternity. And then in the late summer, in the fall and early winter, they'll move on to Spring Avenue. Um, and, and this home today has a Pennsylvania Memorial uh, plaque in front of it. Uh, this is the one where he lived in, on La uh, Stratton Street. And he is, uh, there'll be a plaque on it that also says Eisenhower Home 1918. It was our first family home. That comes from Mamie. She's not actually referring to this home. She's referring to the one that was over on Springs Avenue. Uh, but they will live here. Uh, Mamie, to, to be quite honest with you, she was much of a debutante, more than a debutante than she was a cook or a, cl uh, or a cleaner. She was not the typical army wife. Um, she was very, she went to finishing school. She came from a well-to-do family. Um, they, she doesn't know how to cook anything. She said her specialty was fudge and mayonnaise. Those are the two things that she knew how to make. Um, and she is going to um, have a hot plate here to cook off of, but she's actually gonna go to the mess at Camp Colt every time to have her meals. And little Icky, their, their son, uh, is gonna get a tanker's uniform and he's gonna be the mascot of the camp training court here at Camp Colt. They love Icky. Um, but 
you know, by September of 1917, or I'm sorry, 1918, uh, Eisenhower facing his, his greatest dilemma. And that dilemma is going to be that he has to deal with the influenza outbreak. And this outbreak will hit Gettysburg in late September of 1918, brought upon uh, by troops coming down from Camp Devens, which is in Massachusetts. And that is going to carry the flu down to Adams County. Uh, Eisenhower is going to move very quickly. He is going to quarantine the camp. He's not going to allow anyone into the town. He is also going to try to quarantine the men in the barracks as much as possible. No more than four men per barrack at one time who have them cleaned throughout the day uh, and who also have use Lysol uh, a lot to, to, to disinfect, even though they don't exactly know where this is coming from. Um, and he is going to, to work diligently with the townspeople to try to keep this, this, uh, um, outbreak contained. Um, and the, the town's actually going to open up buildings, the German Reformed Church and Xavier Hall at St. Xavier's Catholic Church to allow the worst cases to come in here and to be cared for. By the end, uh, the townspeople are so grateful for Eisenhower, they're going to thank him in the newspaper, and they are going to see that he only is going to lose about 161 men to the outbreak. Other camps, like a place called Camp Grant up in Illinois, it's going to be so devastating to the to the men that their commandant of that camp will actually take his own life because he's so upset with how many men are dying left and right under his command. Here, Eisenhower is able to cordon off, cordon off the, these men and really show the leadership that he'll show later on in life. Um, so much so that he'll actually be given the Distinguished Service Medal in 1922 for his actions at Camp Colt. Um, and in the time frame, he's actually going to be ordered to send 55 of his doctors away from Camp Colt to other training facilities around the, the country. There are about 33 other camps around the country uh, and to teach these people how to, or their doctors, how to, um, you know, really cut off this, this influenza outbreak. 133 people will die in Adams County, uh, non-military related to the influenza. So Camp Colt is actually, uh, is actually deadlier than the Battle of Gettysburg on the civilian population. Um, but over time, what ends up happening is, uh, in, in the matter of, of time, Camp Colt will be shut down um, in November of 1918 because the armistice was signed on November the 11th. Ironically, Eisenhower had just received orders to move away from Camp Colt. He was going to go from Camp Colt and uh, join a troop ship on November 18th of 1918 and head over to the front. But those orders were rescinded and he is going to help take down Camp Colt. Um, today on the Gettysburg Battlefield, you can visit the site of, of Camp Colt. It's really uh, nothing, not much there, uh, but if you know what to look for, you can find the different things like I've taken the pictures of. Uh, and there is an actual, there's an actual plaque to uh, Camp Colt out on the battlefield, placed there in 1954, has some inaccuracies on it, like whenever he was inaugurated and things, but that uh, sits underneath a cedar tree, which has soil from 48 states. Uh, remember when they had 48 states in 1954, and those that soil comes from famous battlefields around the United States, uh, and that's what's gonna help plant this tree that still sits on the Gettysburg battlefield today. And you can see exactly where the location is, right off the Emmitsburg Road, uh, very close to the high water mark uh, here at Gettysburg. So Ike will we'll move away from Gettysburg, uh, and it, for a matter of time, we'll, we'll jump forward very quickly. He's going to go serve in Manila with uh, MacArthur. That's who you see there in the center. That's uh, <laughs> that's the field marshal uniform of. Uh, of MacArthur because he decided to make himself a field marshal with the Filipino army. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, you can see Ike in 1918. Uh, in 1920, tragedy will strike and his first son, Icky, will die of scarlet fever uh, on January 2nd of 1920 uh, at Camp Meade, Maryland. Uh, obviously, Eisenhower will move up to command of the Allied Expeditionary Forces, uh, leading many different uh, landings throughout World War II. The picture on my left, uh, on the left, is of him, Winston Churchill, and Omar Bradley taking target practice. Uh, Eisenhower was a crack shot, but unfortunately, he hadn't shot in a while. And when he went up to take this picture, he went to pull the trigger, and the safety was on. And a sergeant actually had to walk up behind him and take the safety off. So he was very embarrassed. Uh, and on the right hand side, you can see Eisenhower with his staff. So. Uh, to move forward quickly to, to finish off here in just a few minutes, uh, Eisenhower and Mamie, Ike and Mamie, never own a home in their life. 
Uh, he is going to, after the Second World War, uh, he'll become the president of Columbia University. Uh, his brother Milton will actually be uh, president of Penn State at one point, Johns Hopkins and other colleges. Uh, the Eisenhower boys did very well for themselves. But he and Mandy never owned a home. Uh, so they decide that they want to buy a house. So where do they choose? They choose Gettysburg. And mainly, uh, it's for two reasons. The first reason is the love of history that Ike has. But secondly, George and Mary Allen have moved here, friends of the Eisenhowers, and said, man, we have this farm here. We love it here. Why don't you move here and, and purchase a house? And that's exactly what they'll do. Uh, they'll purchase a house on the backside of Seminary Ridge. Uh, and this is the, the farmhouse. They'll purchase this house in 1950, but they won't move in until uh, their anniversary on July 1st of 1955. The house needs to be renovated. They paid about $40,000 for the house. Uh, I should say they, they paid $25,000 for, for the farm implements and the cows and everything that came with it, and the rest went to the house. They ended up with about 189 acres and a house that was falling apart. So they go in and they completely gut the house, spending $250,000 on renovating this house. Um, most of that, those proceeds came from his book, uh, his book uh, payment for writing Crusade in Europe, his 1948 classic. Uh, the center of the house is the, the original part. And then they will add on wings over here. They'll add on wings on the back and they'll really put together a, a beautiful home that sits today as part of Eisenhower uh, National Historic Site. Uh, a putting green is given to him. A skeet range is given to him. Most of the, most of the things in the house are actually given to them. He has a heli helipad. He has his, his um, show barn out here uh, because he's gonna have at least 250 cattle at one point. Uh, he is going to, to have um, spruce trees that are lining the, the driveway coming down. These spruce trees uh, are given to him by every uh, state of the Republican Party. They're going to plant those for him after he becomes president. Uh, and whenever he has his first heart attack in 1955, he'll come and live at the farm for 38 days. Uh, and every day he will take a walk down this, this pathway uh, and mark how far he's made it because he's trying to rebuild his stamina. And the first tree on the line, which is the farthest from the house, was given to him by Texas, the state of Texas. And he told Mamie one day uh, that he had made it to Texas meaning that he had made it all the way down to the end and he felt that he could go back to the White House and get back to work after his heart attack. But he and Mamie uh, will really enjoy their, their farm here. Uh, the picture on the right is showing the putting green behind them. Uh, you can probably see a part of the skeet range too. On the left-hand side, you can see the back side of the house. Uh, you'll see uh, a screened-in porch. This is actually their favorite room in the entire house. Uh, Eisenhower and Mamie will, will fill the house with mementos and knickknacks given to them from friends. Um, Mamie was so excited that she could make this house her home um, that she was able to pull out things from storage like her sofa that she, she bought over in, in Paris when they lived there when they were serving under General Pershing. Um, and they're just very excited to make this house their home. This is their favorite room in the house. This is actually the sun porch. Uh, the television is right uh, behind where this picture was taken. This painting is actually the last uh, painting that, that Eisenhower was working on. It's of a castle in Scotland. He and Mamie had full use of the third and fourth floors of this castle given to them uh, by the, the people of Scotland, thanking him for his service in the Second World War. Uh, they used to play bridge. Well, not together. She, uh, Mamie would play McCanasta. Ike would play bridge. Smoked a lot. You can see the old ashtrays sitting here. Uh, and one day, Mamie remembered, or I'm sorry, David, his eldest um, grandson, would remember sitting in this room one day. The door was open. It was a summer night. And he and his grandfather were watching uh, Western while Mamie was sitting back where I had circled playing solitaire when a smell came across the room. And Mamie mentioned something to Eisenhower saying that, uh, you know, maybe you should look into that. Ike said he didn't notice anything finished watching a show, stood up, stretched, and went to bed. Mamie then turned to David and said, please go go find uh, Sergeant Mooney and uh, see if something has gone rotten in the kitchen. And she knew what the problem was, and so did David. And that was that uh, one of the hunting dogs came in with a skunk and laid it beside General Eisenhower, who never even noticed it. Uh, and poor Mooney had to go and take care of this skunk. But this was their favorite room in the house. Uh, Mamie, 
she'll put together uh, much of the upstairs herself. She loves pink. She has a pink bathroom. Most of the bedroom is pink. Eisenhower would be up usually by 6 to 6.30 in the morning. She would stay in bed well until after 10 o'clock each morning. Um, so one was an early riser, one was a late riser. And you can see him actually working in his house. Um, he'll, he'll spend summers here or parts of summers here. And the desk that he's working on, because he loves George Washington so much, the desk that he's working on here in the Gettysburg home is actually made from refurbished wood from the White House. Harry Truman had renovated the White House in the 40s. Um, this is wood from the White House made to be um, a replica of George Washington's writing desk. And the White House staff will give it to him in 1954 as a present. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can see his, his beloved study, um, which is very Western themed. His uh, sand trap that he has out here, like I said, he loved to golf. Uh, the sand trap one day will actually be overtaken by two Arabian horses that his daughter, his granddaughter, Susan, was trying to groom. They got loose. They ran into the sand trap, rolled around in it, and then tore up his putting green. Susan was mortified. She thought that, that General Eisenhower was going to be so upset, that her grandfather was going to be so upset. And he said, isn't that the most beautiful sight that you have ever beheld? And uh, apparently didn't do anything about it other than clean up the, the, the um, putting green. You'll notice that there are five stars everywhere after his presidency, and we'll talk about that in a, just here in a second. He is going to ask uh, John F. Kennedy, President Kennedy, as well as Sam Rayburn and Lyndon Baines Johnson to um, give him his old rank of general back uh, because that's what he wanted to be known as. So after the war, he wasn't, or after his presidency, uh, calling him general was actually the thing to call him and not Mr. President because that's the rank that he always wanted to hold was general. Um, and that's what he was very proud of. Um, he has a show barn out here. The show barn, if you came to the farm, didn't matter if you like cattle or not, he was going to bring you out here. Uh, he has, brings dignitaries out here. Prime Minister Nehru will come out here with him, uh, as well as others, and he will paint this barn himself. Well, he'll actually mix the paint himself. Um, it was a red color. He hated it, so he came up with this kind of greenish color um, that's, that's on the barn to this day. Um, and then you can see a few more uh, pictures here. This is actually where uh, um, Bernard Law Montgomery will stay during his uh, stay here in 1957. Loves to cook out. He's always cooking out. Uh, but to get back to the battlefield here very quickly, this is him with, with uh, Churchill. Uh, you can see Marine One landing in the background. Uh, he's the first president to actually use a helicopter. Uh, this is him. I love, I love Churchill with his big cowboy hat on uh, and his big stogie in his mouth. There's all kinds of pictures of these two cruising around in their Cushman um, golf carts. But uh, as we run out of time here, what I want to do is just take us to the battlefield one last time. And Eisenhower loves the battlefield. Uh, according to Mamie, he knew every rock on this battlefield. And that was not a compliment. She couldn't stand the fact that he was always on the battlefield. She was bored by it, in fact. Um, and he was also a menace when he was on the battlefield. After 1961, um, he actually had to go get a Pennsylvania state driver's license because he hadn't had one since 1941. Um, even though he passes according to the, the, the test giver uh, with flying colors, he's actually a menace on the road. Um, he, he's going to take sharp turns. He's going to narrowly avoid hitting cars all the time. His, his uh, grandson is going to talk about driving the car with him and just how horrifyingly shocking an experience it could be. Um, but he spends a lot of time on the battlefield. And this is a picture on the left-hand side of he and Montgomery, Field Marshal Montgomery, who served under him during World War II, as well as uh, during NATO. And the two of them are going to go around the battlefield for two full days. And Eisenhower is going to take him all around to the high, high spots. The first day, everything goes well. We're standing here um, at the statue of the Virginia Memorial. On the right-hand side, you can see them uh, looking at a cannon where I believe is um, going to be placed along Culp's Hill at the time. Um, and when they're on top of Culp's Hill, you can see behind them on the right-hand side a bunch of reporters. So they're going to walk up and in, into the top of one of the one of the um, War Department towers, and up there, Marshall's um, or, or Montgomery's going to start prodding Eisenhower, start talking about how Robert E. Lee was wrong at Gettysburg to make his assault at Pickett's Charge specifically. And three different times, Montgomery can't get a rise out of Eisenhower. And then finally, that good old temper of Eisenhower gets up and he said, well, if you were ever under my command and did what Lee did, I would sack you. 
this was scandalous. This is May of 1957. We're on the cusp of coming into the 100th anniversary of the Civil War. Time Magazine picks up this article uh, and starts writing about it. And so much so that, that Eisenhower is going to start receiving tons and tons of hate mail from everybody. How could you say this about Robert E. Lee? One man from Georgia is actually going to send him a uh, razor, a, a, a piece of leather that you, you sharpen a razor on and said that uh, he would whip Eisenhower with it if he ever had a chance. And he's going to send one to every member of Congress and the Senate if they ever said anything like that about Robert E. Lee. Um, so he turns into this big scandal for for. Eisenhower here out on the battlefield. So leave it to Montgomery. Um, but at other times, he's going to have more pleasant experiences. On the left-hand side, you can see Eisenhower climbing over rocks um, along West Confederate Avenue with uh, Charles de Gaulle. The two of them liked each other very well. De Gaulle's a French general, and eventually the president of the French Republic, who also come out into the battlefield with uh, a man who looks a lot like Montgomery uh, and de Gaulle, and that would be Bruce Catton the famed Civil War historian. Uh, and this is, picture was taken, I believe, in 1961 at the high water mark uh, near Pickett's Charge. So Eisenhower is going to be out on this battlefield a great deal. And he'll use it almost as an equalizer when he goes out to talk to dignitaries and talk to, to other now former military leaders uh, to, to kind of level with them. So he uses the battlefield uh, in a sense, and, and he uses the farm to do the same thing. He'll bring Nikita Khrushchev here uh, in 1959, uh, and he, he's going to be at Camp David. Then he's going to decide that things aren't going as well as he thought they would. And he flies them up on the helicopter to his, his farm, introduces him to his grandchildren, shows him his cows. And Khrushchev is so taken by the, the Eisenhower family, he actually invites them back to, to Russia the next year. Unfortunately, the U-2 incident happened before this could happen, and uh, Eisenhower's invitation was rescinded by Khrushchev, um, and Eisenhower loved to use this, the, the farm, as well as the battlefield itself, as the great equalizer. Um, people loved it, the fact that he lived in Gettysburg, and we'll finish up here. I'll just show you a few slides. He lives in Gettysburg. They love the fact that he's here. Um, and if you don't think the battlefield is, if you didn't think the battlefield was also changed, here's the Wills house. This is uh, where Abraham Lincoln stayed the night before the Battle of, of Gettysburg. You can see the Lincoln room up here. You can also see the old pharmacy down below on the first floor. So the National Park Service owns it today. Don't think that these buildings and these battlefields haven't changed over the years. Uh, we're fortunate to have them, but these are people are still going to be living in these places. You can see that people are just excited to have Ike and Mamie home uh, here to Gettysburg. They, they talk about Ike driving around, going to the local golf course, Mamie going into the Woolworth. Uh, she loved to buy knickknacks. And, and the two of them actually have to learn how to be private citizens again. In fact, Eisenhower um, had to learn how to use a telephone uh, because he hadn't placed a call since uh, about 1940 himself. Uh, so it was pretty interesting. They'll join the Presbyterian Church in Gettysburg. Um, this, this church is a, a very nice place to, to visit. Um, you can see a picture on one of their historic panels that they have on the left-hand side. Uh, his vice president, Nixon, is coming out of the church. Um, this is actually when Nixon was uh, president. And then on the right-hand side, you can see Ike and Mamie coming out of the church. Um, there are pews in this church that were sat upon by Abraham Lincoln, Dwight Eisenhower, John Burns, one of the heroes of Gettysburg, as well as, as um, Richard Nixon, and they all have their pews in here. So he's very much part of the town, he and Mamie, so much so that the first 50-star 50, 50 American flag that was presented to him as president uh, was uh, given to him uh, whenever Hawaii became uh, the, uh, a state. He actually is going to give to the Presbyterian Church in Gettysburg, and that's where it flies today. Um, but eventually, Ike and Mamie will decide that they, they are, have given half a century of their lives to the American people. So what better fitting tribute to them and to their lives than to give, that, give up their home? Um, Eisenhower on the left with two of his brothers will, will open his home, his parents' home in Abilene as a museum during his lifetime. But Ike and Mamie will leave uh, their farm in Gettysburg to the American people. Um, President Eisenhower will um, pass away in March of 1969. Uh, Mamie will die on November 1st of 1979. And a few months later in 1980, uh, this uh, facility was opened by the National Park Service as the Eisenhower National Historic Site. And you can visit it today. 
um, and you have to, well, not today, because it's not open due to COVID, but the, um, you go to the visitor center at Gettysburg, you hop a bus, and it'll take you over to the Eisenhower National Historic Site, which is a fantastic uh, facility. It's my favorite, um, my favorite unit in all the National Park Service, and it's well worth um, a, a stop. Uh, to go over here and to see w what it would be like to live with Ike and Mamie and their home is like a time capsule. Uh, the family was allowed to take, uh, you know, personal belongings with them, the grandkids and, and John, their son. But for the most part, they left everything lock, stock and barrel to the American people. So it's like walking into uh, an absolute uh, time capsule. And um, with that, I want to thank you for, for joining us today um, here and uh, thank Diane for inviting me out to, to talk a little bit about Dwight Eisenhower as well as the Gettysburg Battlefield. Um, and so the next time you head out to Gettysburg and you're walking the fields of Pickett's Charge, uh, you're not just following in the footsteps of, of North Carolinians, Virginians, uh, and Alabamians and others. Uh, you are going to be following the footsteps uh, and tank tracks of Dwight David Eisenhower, who held his first major military command on the Gettysburg battlefield. So with that, I will uh, stop the screen share so that I can see if anyone has any questions. Diane, any questions from Facebook? I have a quick question, Chris. It's, you mentioned the 100 demerits. This is Maggie. Yeah. And you mentioned smoking. I mean, was you said he wasn't a great student. Is 100 demerits a lot? That's about average for that time. OK, um, so it was, he was just a normal across the board Yes, yeah. he'll excel. He can excel in mathematics, uh, English. He was high, towards the top of the class in English. Um, and he, his demerits are basically whenever he loses his temper, playing pranks. He loved to play pranks. Um, a lot of people thought in, in, in a lot of people who didn't go to West Point with him thought that he always followed the rules and that kind of bugged him, which he didn't. Um, he, he actually almost got shot one night in 1919 during a uh, cross country uh, march. They were trying to show how poor the roads were in the United States. So they go on this march one night and he gets another lieutenant and another guy with him and they decide to, to attack the uh, convoy. And as they do so, they spooked one of the one of the centuries and they shot at them. Uh, so they start sending these reports that they're being attacked by Native Americans uh, and they have to go into their commanding officer and say, no, that was us just being idiots. Um, so he, he was known to, to play pranks, always smoked um, during the during D-Day, uh, the, the, the lead up to D-Day. He would start lighting a cigarette, put it down, pick up another one, not even realizing how much he's smoking. He's drinking two to three pots of coffee a day at that point as well. Um, I see one, one uh, question that was typed in. How did uh, he get the nickname of Ike? Actually, all of the boys were nicknamed Ike in the family. Uh, his just stuck. You had uh, Big Ike, Little Ike, who was Dwight. Um, and then you had the others. There were six, six brothers in all, and they were um, a family of bruisers, let me tell you. That's actually what, what uh, Mamie's going to call him the first time she sees him. She thought he was a bruiser. Uh, but his nickname is the only one that sticks. So he's called Little Ike, um, and it comes from his, from his parents. Um, so the little drops off, and he just sticks with Ike. And you mentioned something just at the very end, your favorite unit or something you said about going over to the Eisenhower home and you said it was one of your favorite something. So that, that's a, a unit of the National Park Service. It's one of the, it's overseen by the National Park Service today. You mean the and site itself is one of your favorites in the national parks? Yeah, uh, above all, it's my number one favorite. Really? It's a, it's a okay. great place to go visit. It's well interpreted, meaning that they have good good people out there telling you stories. Um, and the, the, the grounds themselves are well maintained and the house itself honestly is like a, is like a time capsule. Because mm -hmm. uh, okay. when you walk in the house, you'll see a big portrait of John above, um, You'll see a big portrait of John Eisenhower, his West Point graduation uh, portrait. You'll see the log book. Everybody was supposed to sign into the farm. So you see some of the most famous people signing in to the log book. Mamie made you do that. So you'd see the names of Ronald Reagan, Bob Hope, uh, Richard Nixon, and many, many others, Winston Churchill, Montgomery. Um, they all had to sign in because uh, that was the thing to do. And then the wallpaper is original. All 48 states at the time are represented with their state seals from 1955. Um, and basically walking into that place is like walking into Ike and Mamie's home. Um, and I think they do a really great job of keeping to the, to the narrative of what Ike and Mamie wanted. Okay. Hey Chris, I was just curious. Um, 
how many troops total were there at, at Fort Colt? So, um, so this one was what they call this is Camp Colt. Um, yeah. So, so there are 34 military installations um, created by the War Department during 1917, 1918. It's very political if you're going to get one of these because it's big money. Uh, the, the U.S. Army is going to spend about a half a billion dollars on creating these 34 camps. So you wanted to bring people in. Um, most of them are named after a Civil War general. Uh, this one was actually named after Samuel Colt, surprisingly, who was never anywhere near Gettysburg uh, during the battle. But you'll have places like Camp Grant, Camp Thomas, Camp, um, Camp Hancock, Camp Forrest, Camp Lee. That's where Fort Lee comes from, Camp Devon. So you could go down a whole line of these things. Half of them were for the uh, National Guard. The other half were for the U.S. regular army. Um, and so he would have been sent all regular army troops. And at, at its peak, it had 6,400 men. But he'll process through there about 10,600. It's like 10,583, like 10, um, I think is the, the exact number who go through that, that facility. But um, its peak efficiency was about 6,400. And you only had one tank. To, mm. to train all those guys. Thank you. Uh, Bob was asking about the, how smoking affected him later in life. Um, Eisenhower is going to have multiple heart, heart attacks. His first one will take place in 1955. Um, and the, it's really going to slow him down. He's a very, very active man, very active. Uh, but it's really going to start to take a toll on him. His smoking, the stress, the coffee that he's drinking. Um, and he's, he's eventually going to start having a series of heart attacks from 1955 onward. His last year of his life is lived in uh, Walter Reed Military Hospital, and that's where he'll, he'll pass away in March of 1969. Um, but it's really going to, to, to start affecting him. It's also his diet as well. Um, Mamie and, and Ike have a, have a uh, French trained chef. Uh, but they love meat and potatoes, fried chicken, anything else you could think of. Uh, so they're living the good life of the 1940s and 50s. And um, so, but it'll eventually, the, the lifestyle will catch up with him. Um, and he'll, he'll eventually die of really heart disease in um, 1969. One other question I have, Chris. Um, I was shocked that the military used Gettysburg this way. Um, you know, I've been aware of recent encroachments and everybody up in arms, you know, about protecting Gettysburg. Was there some time when it was like, let's keep this as, when did that happen that this is hallowed ground or is it really not as hallowed in terms of it being protected as I suspect? Well, they looked at it as hallowed ground. The, the, the guys really love being there. Uh, unfortunately, when you let soldiers who are 18, 19, 20 years old who have never been away from home, uh, loose on a battlefield, they're going to do what they want to do. Um, some of the guys uh, are going to go try digging for bullets because they all wanted to take one bullet with them over to fight in Europe. Um, they'll find at least two deceased soldiers um, from the Civil War on the battlefield that were buried when they're either building building latrines or doing other things. Um, so they find one Confederate and one Union soldier, one in 17, one in 18. Um, and then they're also going to have... Um, they're also going to understand that they're damaging the battlefield. There is a memorial association that's there in 19, uh, 17, 18, 19, and they're, they're just seeing everything that's happening. Uh, so the army will try to put it back together um, as best they can. And by 1920, I mean, they're going to start doing some estimates on how, how much damage they have done to the battlefield. And it's not just Gettysburg, uh, Chickamauga, the, the, which is down by Fort Oglethorpe in Georgia. Uh, it's Northwest Georgia. Chickamauga is going to have trenches built on it uh, to, to have faux battles and train there. They'll have Camp uh, George Thomas during the Spanish-American War, which I think processed something like 50,000 troops through there. Um, so by 1933, the, the War Department has to figure out how to stop spending money because of the Great Depression. And one way to, to uh, lighten their budget is to get rid of these parks. So then they'll transfer it over to the Department of the Interior. Uh, who own it today, who, who oversee the parks today, starting in 1933. Um, it's more financial than it is, you know, looking at it as, as hollowed ground. But the Army absolutely looks at it that way. Uh, I didn't, I didn't mean to... disrespect, but they couldn't, did they stop using it that way in 33 or long before 33? Uh, as, you know, 1922, they're out there doing stuff. They, they still have staff rides out there today, which are essentially tours, um, but they will stop using it as military installations, 1946. 
Uh, that's whenever you start wow. to see it. Because okay. they'll have a German POW camp at Gettysburg. They'll have a, a training camp for what we would call PSYOPs today um, there, which was a secret base, um, in which only the flagpole, I think, is the only thing that exists there today. It's actually the, the Boy Scout camping ground today. Um, and they, um, so, so they'll, they'll keep using it all the way up up through that point. Um, and, you know, in their defense, historic preservation at that time, you know, there aren't these great studies like we, we figure out what we should and shouldn't be doing to these battlefields. Uh, some of it should be common sense, you know, but, you know, that's the glory of hindsight and the military is the military and they got to get a job done. And they want to win a war. Um, they're going to do what they need to do to, to, to get the war done. Um, so, yeah, they'll, they'll figure it out. They'll finally stop, you know, in the 1930s, they'll turn it over, but they'll still use it, use not just Gettysburg, but other battlefields during um, the 1940s through the Second World War. Um, and, you know, it, it, we benefit in a way because this is more history that we can talk about with, with Gettysburg. Um, but unfortunately, you know, it does do some physical damage to, to the battlefield. Um, but it gives us a, a treasure trove of stories to talk about when it comes to Eisenhower and others. Great. I don't, we don't have any other Facebook questions and I don't think, I think you addressed everything on Zoom. So thank you, Chris, very much. It was an interesting talk. I had no idea that there was so much more to Gettysburg than just the Civil War, the battle that occurred there. I could do an entire talk just on this. This is just the tip of the iceberg. When the, when the Marines come back, that's when the real fun begins. Um, when you went over to Europe, was that last year? Uh, that was the last time I was over, yeah. Yeah. Did you go around? I mean, was that primarily for World War II tour? Yeah, I, the, both World Wars. You know, oh. so, so it was uh, Verdun and then also uh, a lot of Normandy um, and then heading down into the Hundred Years War, which is another fascinating uh, mm -hmm. aspect um, of, of that area. But yeah, the, the battlefield preservation over there is much different. Uh, whenever you talk about hollow ground, when you ask where the battlefield is in Europe, they're going to look at you cross-eyed um, and like you're an idiot. But very, very few acres are actually preserved in, the, um, in Europe. Uh, most of that is actually still private farmland. That's initially when they started making uh, started making uh, battlefields here. They thought that, oh, this will always be farmland. All we need to do is put thin roads in. So there are two different plans that we used. Um, one's called the Antietam plan, which is let's just buy roads and small slivers because there's always going to be, be farmland here. The other plan is called the Chickamauga plan. Let's go buy every acre that we can. So they buy over 5,000 acres at Chickamauga in 1895. But unfortunately, people got wind to what was happening and land speculators come in and jacked up the prices. So that kind of killed it. So for the longest time, it was let's put in this road and own 20 feet or 30 feet off of either side, um, which is now why the American Battlefield Trust exists to, to fill in those those gaps and other places uh, in Europe, you know, to buy a five acre plot in a place called uh, Foix which in the Band of Brothers series, it's mispronounced Foy, it's Foy, uh, it's known as a Bois Jack. It took them 20 years to, to get those five acres saved because again, it was an uphill battle. They didn't understand what we were doing or what they were doing over there, but they, those acres are, are preserved um, and that, that's outside of Estonia. And then if you go over to, to um, Normandy, uh, La Pointe du Hoc, uh, the uh, American cemeteries at Lake Colville Sumer, those are uh, American soil. Those were given to us by the, the French. Um, you know, Mark Clark will actually say that, you know, we didn't come here as conquerors. We just asked for soil to bury our dead. And that's what the French did for us um, and, and Belgians and, and Luxembourg as well. Um, so, you know, it's a, much different when you're over there. They don't look at these as battlefields. They look at it, that's Bob's farm. That's Jim's farm. You know, this isn't a battlefield. Um, but you know, you, you can find a lot of these places over there today. So, um, a lot of it is, is either traipsing across private land or finding, um, finding slippers where you can, you can find a monument or two here, a monument or two there. Normandy's, Normandy's a little bit different than anywhere else because there are so many, uh, so many, uh, monuments and, and the townsfolks really embrace that. But, um, other parts of, of France and Belgium and especially Germany, not so much. Interesting. Okay, um, well, as I said at the beginning of the talk, uh, tentative plans to have a live uh, lecture on September 12th with uh, Steve Fan coming up from 
Washington and talking about the Civil War defenses of Washington. And if you are um, just uh, itching to read some Civil War materials, uh, we're reordering. Uh, give me a call. Uh, we can place a hold for you. And uh, with that, um, we'll call it a close. Have a good couple months and hopefully uh, stay safe. And thank you for joining us. Thanks, Diane. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye.